So I did the need it. Uh, more about me if you need to. Uh, you can just look at me, look me up. I'm pretty transparent. I'm pretty transparent in the industry. Um, like Marcella said, I'm based out of New York City. This is my hometown. I do most of my work here, although I have traveled to various parts of the world. Um, have serviced cl companies, clients of different size and lines of business. Um, yeah, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about agility <laughs> and, and, and scaling, of course. So I'm just going to say in a very humble way, I've been around and I've been around long enough to see certain things. Uh, not, every, not, every, not, not everything that I have seen I'm proud of. Some things were great, some things were not. Now, w this, this way of self-introduction may not be very common, may not be very standard. And what I usually get, I usually struggle between being overly pessimistic or overly realistic. That's what I get from people from time to time. Now, this is really not me. I'm not a pessimist. I'm not a pessimist uh, who always sees a glass half uh, half empty. I'm just a, and, and, and I'm definitely not this person. I'm not someone who just brags about uh, successes and lives in a la-la land. I am someone like this. I'm someone who tries to think hard. And hopefully after some time, I have this aha moment. And I wish that everyone here, and you know, I wish the same thing to, to all my colleagues, to think hard about things they say they do. And um, of course, uh, you will have an aha moment, aha moments um, at, as, as time goes by. I'm very easily reachable, and um, I'm happy if you reach out to me um, independently or through Rick or Marcelo. Uh, my LinkedIn is there. My, I actually run the largest one in the world, a large scale Scrum Meetup. I, I created back in 2015 from scratch. It's, it's uh, pushing to 3,000 people and the most active one in the world. So there is something I consider um, a community service accomplishment, and I'm proud of it, probably more than anything else, uh, more than other things. If you ever want to uh, learn about less and more to say about less in the next few um, minutes, um, you can definitely do it in a structured way, and I will share this information through Rick and Marcella with all of you. Now. Uh, first, I would, I would like to introduce a little bit of history um, and give the picture of large-scale Scrum. Now, we refer to this as the, uh, the big picture, or the, I call it the onion, because it has concentric circles. Principles, then frameworks, then guides, and then experiments. We have 600-plus six, six, experiments collected and documented about less over the course of more than a decade. Now. Here's an interesting thing, and I think Marcella alluded to this. It's, it's a very small community of less coaches and, and trainers out there. Why? And I'm, I'm definitely being, I'm proud to be one of them. I'm one of a few that resides in the United States. Well, because uh, large-scale Scrum as the framework, if you will, as a discipline, it's, it's not the good word, it's as a framework, has zero uh, formal marketing. There is no sales machine. There is no, it's not cash making machine. It's not a client milking machine. It is something that is uh, easy to unpack, unwrap and install. It doesn't have a marketing offshoot. It's only by word of mouth. It's only by, it's almost like uh, for VIP only, right? It's only for companies and organizations that are really interested in changing systemically, deeply, uh, meaningfully and, uh, uh, for a long lasting continuous improvement. Now, interestingly, although less is uh, least known, it's the longest and the most authentic. Authenticity is the key here. Uh, the first last book was written back in 2008. Uh, then the, the other one was written in 2010. Only in 2016, we had the what's called the Green Book that talks about principles. The first two talked about experiments and guides. And frankly, they're a little dense and a little hard to read. So if you ever want to pick up a book and read, start with a green one. In fact, my colleague and friend uh, from Seattle, Michael James, uh, actually put them in order. So if you ever want to read those, read them in this order, left to right. Now, again, on point and it's important. A large scale scrum is not as well known, especially in the United States, because it has practically no marketing but at the same time as we get to know it a little bit you will understand how authentic and how original it is okay 
Now, this is something that is important to understand before we do any deeper dives into large-scale Scrum. Organizational structure is the first order factor that defines organizational ecosystem. Everything else just follows. Culture, mindset, behaviors, norms, values, all that stuff is great, but it comes after. And unfortunately, this is what we oftentimes see less experienced agile coaches uh, not stressing senior management. It's, it's practically impossible to change someone's mindset or culture or behavior if an organizational ecosystem around that person doesn't change. Like we're all adults here, mature individuals, changing our behaviors uh, would be rather difficult unless we change the ecosystem we're all a part of, okay? And this kind of jives with um, the fifth law of Lorman's law. It's called the culture, of, um, the Lorman's law of organizational behavior, where it says culture follows structure. So in order to change culture, we first need to address the organizational structure that sits upstream. I stole this, um, plagiarized it literally, uh, this little snippet from Craig Larmans, one of the co-founders of Large Scale Scrum. He published it on, on the Scrum Alliance website in 2015. Uh, it's pretty much, you know, I, in fact, I call this entire thing, call it a thing, as a sushi roll, because when you eat a sushi, if you like sushi, the only flavor you can get if you bite through all of its layers, uh, the seaweed, rice, and some other in in internal stuff. So I can refer to this as a sushi roll approach when you uh, change your organizations. Uh, you have to take um, a look, a close look, not just at IT practices and improve them um, there. You have to look at legal practices, product management, HR policies, site strategies, uh, many other dimensions of organizational structure. And that makes large scale Scrum is an, organi an organizational design framework. Now, many questions may come, and you know, I address this almost every week when I do training. What do you mean by, do you, do you change HR policies across the firm? Do you change the way the budget across the, the entire enterprise? The answer is uh, no, not it, ideally, yes, you probably should, but for large scale scrum adoption, many things you can do implicitly as opposed to explicitly. Let me address it with q and if, if, if it comes. But let me just say organizational structure is the first order factor, and you have to look at multiple facets of organizational yeah. design, and that's what Les does. Um, you may want to mute yourself, folks, uh, just a little huh? bit of feedback there. Patricia, yeah, thank you. Um, let me first give you a couple of very big problems we all are facing, and I heard Rick mention at the beginning, there are many people here that are agile coaches. So let's together, as a community, understand that we are up against some pretty serious challenges out there. Now, I, I, I kind of coined this, but you, I'm, I'm happy if you plagiarize the slide. I refer to it as a triple constraint or triple taxation on client companies. Now, it usually puts a smirk, if, a smile on people's face when they read into it. Uh, when you see big, a big consultancy with a big bang agile transformation approach that has a multi-year transformation plan that costs millions of dollars, it comes in, in the same bandwagon with a very heavy monolithic framework uh, that pretty much involves every organizational tier there is. And um, on top of it, you have an, an tool institution to handle all of this. It's a, pretty, it's a pretty penny. It's a very serious investment that a company needs to make. So I am alluding to you, and I'm not sure if you are uh, independent coaches or represent companies. Try to stay away. Try to steer your clients and your uh, companies away from this problem. This kind of uh, a deeper, it's, it's, it's sort of a deeper dive into this problem and I'm building this up for a reason. Um, I call it a resource processing food chain when you have these little green folks there, true agile experts, true coaches, true ambassadors of agility, um, lost in between thousands of, um, you know, call them whatever, call them uh, um, cheerleaders. It's a masquerade. And now we have this multi-tier, uh, food processing chain by uh, by which these client companies get um, these people. It costs a pretty penny. And this is not a trivial problem. And that's why I would like to stress it. Between this slide and this slide, we're talking about some serious challenges organizations are having. And that's why some of you, and I know I do, uh, we, we face these 
challenges and pessimism sometimes sometimes organizations um, are exhibiting when they uh, hear the word agile or they hear the word uh, the term coach okay now there are, there are different ways to learn and this is i also coined this term it's a ddt it's not a tdd it's not a test driven development which was, would be an amazing thing it's a deck driven transformation and you've been a lot and you have been around if you have been around long enough and if you've seen some of these approaches uh you know used by large consultancies you will probably know what i'm talking about a nine thousand dollar day deck um it's a penny and if you multiply by the number of days it's a pretty penny that's one way to learn which will typically not uh long uh not last for long penetration depth of learning is going to be pretty shallow or you can do what we do in large scale scrum very very intimate very deep dive learning in front of the whiteboard uh designing developing system models craig larman chet hendrickson maybe you know him from um other agile circles one of the guys that have defined what xp is um of course we can do it online as well now about less so take a look at this uh, graphic and think of it this way what you see on the on the left hand side is a typical agile transformation as you have seen this most likely very broad and very shallow with with the focus on things that are not completely trivial but of second or third degree of importance metrics maturity models reporting racks kpis tools operating models these are the jargon words these are the this is the jargon many companies have been using and very um inefficiently i would think because uh, they end up doing they end up scratching the surface a little bit calling um this um a, you know a temporary uh, premature win and moving on to something else without changing things systemically now on the left hand on the right hand side you see an alternative to this and this is what large scale scrum is it's a deep and narrow way to change your organizational design you are looking at so in the three key principles of large scale scrum that you need to remember and of course this session may cover just you know so little it's deep and narrow as opposed to broad shallow that's principle adopt the, that this is the adaption principle number one uh it is top down and bottom up which means we have to influence senior management and teams and individuals from both directions uh equally uh, from the bottom, we need to do a lot of coaching and training and mentorship and, and initial support. And from the top, we need to do as much of the same because some of the uh, organizational design decisions are being made at the very top of the house. And quite frankly, quite frankly, if we don't address it, it will be also very superficial. So that's what we try to do. We try to get from senior management what's called an informed consent, that they are willing and um, understand what it takes um, and willing to go um, the long way. Um, organizational design implications of lot less adoption needs to be well understood. And of course, um, the third key principle is by volunteering. There is no such thing in large scale scrum adoption as we're going to, we are going to unpack and install less because someone told us. It is by volunteering at multiple, um, at various organizational levels and um, across multiple steps in the process. So many people out there that I speak to, they say, well, this XYZ heavy framework has been installed upon us and we are mandated to follow it. Well, who installed it and who mandated it? No one knows. It's some sort of a centralized decision that this is the way to go and going back to that taxation triangle triple taxation you can probably uh, bet bet your money that someone who uh, is, is probably not the best person to make these decisions because they don't understand agility have made that organizational impact decisions large consultancies huge heavy frameworks tooling solutions if you think of the word agile and it was meant to be adaptive natively if you substitute the word adaptive and agile if, if not changes if the meaning doesn't change that means you got it right but nine out of ten times if you change the 
one for another, it lo loses its meaning because what typically what's called agile isn't really adaptive. It's just you know a term that people use very loosely and very uh, ir irresponsibly. Now, I don't really understand one thing. So I'm not. I'm sure everyone here understands what Scrum is. Now, you can paraphrase and parse my um, slide. I'm not exactly sure what this is, but if you bury Scrum on the thousands of layers of organizational complexity without changing uh, a thing, you know, by without changing ways people work, mainly just relabeling existing roles with new terminology, um, what exactly are you changing, right? So a big question I hear I should ask, where is the customer feedback between teams that actually produce value? and I put them in green over there somewhere down below. And customers, and where are the customers? So when you have this thick organizational structure and you have an unpacking it all, a very heavy solution that is, that is just put on the top of the org structure without changing anything, why would you expect any systemic, any meaningful organizational improvements? A couple of weeks back, I had, um, uh, the well-known, uh, respected gentleman in, in my own meetup. His name is Dave Snowden. Maybe you know him. He's from the UK. Uh, it was the second time he attended large-scale Scrum meetup of New York City. I kind of paraphrased it. Uh, you can follow the links below and, and actually watch his recording. This is, he is pretty adamant. He's probably more eloquent and more adamant and more educated than I am in this, you know, for sure, in this area. Uh, as When it comes to research and analytics, um, and he pretty much framed it well. There, there was a, it, it's almost like an organizational schema out there, right? Large consultancies are not out there to help you with small incremental improvements. It's not their business model to begin with. The business model is to engage longer and to stick around longer. And these are, these are multi-year solutions that really basically just rearrange deck seats on Titanic and don't change much. So I'm happy if you follow the links and play it for yourself. I'm not going to paraphrase Dave here, but just be mindful of this. So this, is, this is one of the ways to scale, of course, right? But this is another way, right? You take the existing model, and this is really not a model. This is something that more than a decade ago was um, experimented by one company, and everyone who used to work for that company today tell, are telling you, do not copy paste from what we did. It does not work. But no, yet we go through this masquerade and we take these uh, fancy names and we just relabel existing organizational structures into them by either flipping them on the side or just creating a direct mapping from one to another. And that defeats the whole purpose. Hen 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 I can't pronounce ever his name. Henrik Kneiberg, who is one of the people that was at Spotify um, back you know back in the days he begs everyone he goes on a record he he writes articles and, and blogs do not copy from us it meant for us it made sense for us when we were a 50 60 man company we, we grew out of it. it never made sense to why, why would you take um this approach and try to apply it to a large investment bank that has thousands and thousands of people okay of course the best to do if you look at real product groups, not so-called fancy tribes or sometimes fleets or, or I've heard terms that, you know, give me a cringe-worthy feeling, people like improvising. Uh, if you look at real teams, real feature teams, not component teams or not so-called um, squads, you know, they call them squads, but they have 100% of outsourcing and everyone does their own component-centric work. If you look at communities as communities by volunteering only and not as chapters that used to be uh, vertical organizational structures flipped on their side 90 degrees and now they call chapters. If you do the alternative, you may have a better success. Now, with this, I'm going to say large scale scrum is scrum. If you roll back, if you do a rollback transaction in SQL and go back to the original and think of scrum, then it would be easier for you to understand what less is. Large-scale Scrum is Scrum done by 
X number of teams working together side by side on the same cadence for the same one product owner, not fractal, you know, one team has one BO, BA or P, PO proxy or proxy or proxy, not that. One, the entire last product group has one product owner works for the same product on the same product out of the same backlog. List, this is not less. Taking basic scrum, copy, pasting, copy, pasting, copy, pasting, copy, paste. You may look like, oh, we're scaling that. No, you're copy pasting stuff that is probably meaningless. I mean, each one of these teams may have to be treated as a separate standalone team that maybe it, it, they do, uh, maybe they operate as a, as a good scrum team. But just because you have a bigger number does not mean you have scale. So this is really not scaling. Mostly we see this approach at, at organizations that are trying to chase some numbers and beat someone else to the punch and meet some end of year number in terms of how many scrum teams do you have? Oh, you must be scaling now. No, you're not scaling. You're just probably relabeling existing uh, organizational structures like component teams um, into so-called scrum teams, okay? Less is not many teams doing their own scrum. Even if you do very healthy, very efficient scrum and delivered potential shippable product increment at the, end, at the end of every sprint, it still would not be less if you did it multiple times. Less is between two to eight teams scrumming together on the same product. So if you think about it this way, different horses running for the same finish line, each ad hoc trying to beat each other to the punch and different jockeys setting strategy and vision and, and priorities. This is not less. This, on the other hand, could be less, okay? And maybe this is not the best analogy. Uh, one jockey, um, you know, it's, it's really not a product owner thing to, 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 to whip a leash, right? Uh, to, um, to whip a leash. However, maybe the analogy is, is, is helpful because now you have X number of horses pulling the same carriage in the same direction on the same cadence, same strategy, vision, mission. Now, next slide is gonna be kind of a quick, quick one to pass through. Not every scrum anti-pattern is obvious. Like, here's an example of obviously good, healthy scrum, uh, cross-component-centric development with continuous integration with potential shippable product increment coming off the assembly line every sprint. This one is obviously an anti-pattern, right? We got analysis and design and then a bunch of development sprints and then test and sprint. This is, we call it a mini waterfall within, you know, scrum close, right? This is not so obvious to many. Oh, we are sprinting. We're sprinting along the components. You might be actually using some of the good mechanic of scrum, you know, going through daily routine, going through planning, yada, yada, yada. But in the end, at the tail end, what do you deliver? You deliver an IOU. I owe you a component that needs to be integrated and bug fixed and the tons of other things that are done down the road. Now, XYZ large frameworks that do not really pay much attention to feature central development because why would they? Stuff that is being delivered is not facing in, um, in the immediate customers. It gets rolled into projects and programs and portfolios and portfolios and portfolios. Who cares as long as work gets done? They really don't care. And it is very easy to see those types of work, those types of teams operating in a very component-centric way, because guess what? There'll be someone at the tail end who's gonna pick up their undone work and be responsible for releasing it and be responsible for integrating it, okay? So the fundamental difference between large-scale Scrum and other things is that large-scale Scrum is Scrum. It's just also expected that you have a very large product that requires many people, many more than just three to nine, as we know in Scrum. Uh, we may have more teams working, but they work on the same cadence together, side by side, with a lot of cohesion and a lot of collaboration. Um, very important for less. It's really not just less, it's really organizational challenge I'm going to expose now. But I'm going to then tell you why it's so important and less. 
I'm sure you can, it's very basic SQL, right? If your organization is uh, keen on supporting agile roles and is willing to go uh, the distance uh, to change, uh, to change its job titles to support agile work, I give it a thumbs up, it's great. But if someone runs overnight this daily, uh, this night batch job uh, on your databases and you label a bunch of roles into new roles because now they have the word agile in it or they associate with Scrum, it's a really bad thing. It's a masquerade. Taking a senior agile, taking a uh, senior project manager because his title is senior and his pay grade is XYZ and now calling him a senior agile coach. So it's, it's, a, it's a very silly thing to do. Or taking a senior business analyst, oh, his pay grade is at certain level, let's call him a product owner. It's a silly thing to do. Now in large scale Scrum on point, for example, a Scrum master is a full-time role. It never goes away. We expect this person to be very seasoned, very well-versed, uh, very um, well uh, experienced with Scrum, and also being um, a team level coach and organizational design uh, expert. Over time, his or her focus may change from team and product, a team and product ownership, and it will wind down uh, and refocus on development practices, practices in the organization. But the role does not go away. And unless we recommend that person to handle no more than three teams. So if unless we have two to eight teams, that's a recommended number because of beyond that we exceed how much a single product owner can support. Um, then you're really looking at, at two and a half, three uh, Scrum Masters per less at a minimum, maybe more. Um, again, important, important in general, but specifically for less. This is what we often see uh, in, with large heavy forks. We refer to it as a pragmatic Scrum, right? You have a product owner, you have a team there, and you've got a bunch of proxies and proxies of proxies and proxies of proxies of proxies. Now, where's the uh, feedback loop between a team and a, and a real customer? There's so much going on. There's so many different organizational layers that sit in between. And this is a classic example of local optimization because every person here is local optimized to do the best they can to translate from someone upstream to someone downstream. Now in large scale Scrum, we stress the importance of short feedback loops between different parties. Requests go from users and customers directly into a product owner, but then prioritization goes only from a product owner into teams. And of course, this is the alternative because here you don't see any uh, middlemen sitting in between. Now we also see prioritization goes as much as possible through, uh, there's one error actually that's missing. There should be an error here. Let's see if I can fix it on the fly. I think I'm going to do it because it's pretty important. Let me take this error. Oh, I can, this is, a, this is an image. But clarification as much as possible goes from users and stakeholders into teams, no middlemen. No programs managers, no portfolio managers, no project managers. It's a direct communication. In a large scale Scrum, we bring, just like in Scrum, we bring very closely together teams, people that actually deliver value, deliver work, and customers and users that request those changes. And there, if there's any need for clarification, it goes directly from one on another. And that's how we give sanity back to a product owner so that she can actually support up to eight teams. Now, more question I expect, how does it really happen? What events are we looking at? When does it happen? That's all can be definitely discussed, but just take on this point. In, in large scale Scrum, a product owner is a real role. It's not a fake role. It's not a surrogate. It's not a proxy. It's not a proxy of a proxy. It's not a delegate. There are no program and portfolio managers that sit on the top of a product owner that make this happen. There are no organizational layers that separate development teams and real customers or users. 
And of course, the question is, well, how come? We have all these people in the organization. What, would, what are we going to do with them? Well, here's a secret I have to share with you. Large-scale Scrum is not about scaling. It is about descaling. In, in classes, as when, I, when, when I teach less, this is usually uh, an aha moment for many people. What do you mean descaling? In order to scale agility, in order to scale Scrum, you need to descale organizational complexity. And this includes roles, layers, processes, and other things that sit in between. So when you descale, it's almost like you have to, in order to build a skyscraper, you need to remove the debris from the, from the foundation, okay? Think of it that way. So less is about descaling your organizational complexity. Um, on the same subject of product ownership, let me say something else. I don't believe in quality of doing anything blindly. I think there could be, you can, you can hit and you can miss and you can maybe get lucky, but nine out of 10 times, it's a risk, it's a high risk. So here you're looking at the typical situation we see with organizations that have unpacked and installed a large, uh, successful, commercially successful framework onto themselves. They, really, they don't really have to change much. Well, take existing roles and relabel them into new roles because we're not really changing. We're just playing the, um, we're doing the agile theater or agile masquerade. It costs millions of dollars, but we're really not changing. We're not make, becoming more adaptive. Um, and of course you have people in old roles playing a new, people with old job titles, people that get incentivized and promoted and recognized according to the old rules. Now they've been asked to play these new roles. They're not educated properly. They're not equipped with knowledge. They're not incentivized the right way. And of course, this leads to lots of problems. And of course, there are teams there that get the short end of the stick. So something has, something has to give and something gets, gets the short end. It's someone gets the short end of the stick. Of course, in large scale Scrum, uh, we, um, look at this slightly differently well significantly different i should say in large scale scrum the product owner if he or she is the centerpiece here there is a direct communication with high management direct communication with customers and users nothing in between sits there shouldn't be any translation layers this is obviously the the, the well known this is the dotted line between the scrum master and the product owner of course, with the team. Now, check this out. This dotted line is the um, amplification of what I said in a one slide, one slide ago. Direct relationship between customers and users and teams. No one is in between. And customer, real customers and real users talk directly to real developers. Um, I'm going to say just one more thing about what we often see with large scale, uh, I'm sorry, with large complex so-called agile frameworks. You see lots of local optimization around roles, people that are hands off, people that really are not in the trenches doing work, yet people that dictate how things should get done enterprise architects, enterprise solution architects, chief architects, we call them also PowerPoint architects. These people do not really write code. Maybe they never did. For the most part, they write PowerPoint decks and they tell doers how to do their work. Okay, of course, in large scale scrum, and this is, thinking of this way, each one of these graphics could be unpacked as a huge box of discoveries. So like this graphic, for example, talks about agile and um, technical excellence that we stress so much in large scale Scrum. Test automation, continuous integration, continuous delivery, acceptance testing, architecture and design done by people that do development. Now, I am prepared to answer many, many questions about dynamics and interaction. And like I say, 
what happens during runtime? Yeah, there are many, many things we can discuss. This is just scratching the surface. But uh, the alternative to le from left to right is this, is that it is not a single person. It's not a single team of specialists that are telling the rest of the technology organization how to do their work. There are lots of lots of continuous improvements that go along the way. Now, I am, um, I was prepared, I'm prepared to take uh, lots of questions. So I wanted to make this uh, you know, monologue relatively short. And I would like to open the floor to, um, to as many questions as, as I could get. And I will be using, I will be leveraging another repository of graphics. And as you can see, my slides are almost have no, no words to them uh, to answer your question. But before I do that, let me give you one thing. I'm not, this is not a political statement and you may be recognized ahead, but I am so much not about politics. I'm about to leave. Huh? I was about to leave when I saw that hat. Yeah. <laughs> I want to coin my own statement. Let's make a Julie the Great again. Right. And I believe, genuinely believe, genuinely believe that Scrum is a very authentic, very gen, very original, um, agile way of working, adaptive way of working. And large scale Scrum is Scrum. It's not Scrum underneath uh, many organizational layers of complexity, projects, programs, portfolios. It is not that. Large scale Scrum is Scrum. So we can successfully, and there are 600 plus experiments and more than a decade of um, experience collected and three books authentically written chronologically that pr um, prove that. So I'm inviting you to consider this as a potential way of improving uh, your lives and lives of your clients. Okay. So with that, I would like to open this uh, forum for questions. Folks. I see there are a lot of um, chat yes. window activity. So if I may, my first question would be, uh, you mentioned that there is no uh, middleman between the customer and the team itself. Um, could this or how, uh, how does less address this issue in the way that we make sure that there is a collaboration just like it's specified within the Agile principles and not that this could probably derail uh, an iteration, an ongoing iteration. Sure. So, okay, well, it sounds like, how do these guys talk to each other, right? So. Yeah, my, 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 my point would be try to, since the client, since there is no middleman, in this case, the, the product owner, who could probably negotiate or, or talk with his client to see his real need, um, probably the client could derail a certain plan or something. So that's, well, that's pretty much what I'm trying to so see Omar, how it's managed. So I'll, uh, Omar, so let me um, first of all make it clear. So let me, uh, I'm not sure why I pulled this up. By the way, there's a huge website. There is a body of knowledge, the universe of knowledge that has been collected. It's immense. Their URL is pretty short, less.work, so you can always refer to it. I'm going to leverage some of these graphics so, so I don't have to recreate. Um, well, first of all, in large-scale Scrum, we strongly uh, stress the importance of short feedback loops and direct communication. Like, I'll give you one example. Uh, let's take sprint planning, right? Uh, again, a much longer discussion to have who goes what, who goes where and when. However, each team in large-scale Scrum is within very close proximity to another team. If it's not, we strongly recommend this being physical, but if they are uh, separated by uh, different localities, by different sites, we strongly recommend having them very close to one another uh, through some digital aids, through some you know electronic means. You, uh, your question was about how do we make sure there is synergy between what customers want and what the teams deliver? Uh, what, 
uh, in, in this case, it's more specified to what they're currently working on. Within a, a specific sprint, we can have that planning. But my concern is that the client will, uh, that that direct communication could, in essence, derail what the, what the team is working on. But let me ask you this question. So, so before we do less adoption flip, and we, we set the teams to sale, we spend at least a few months prep of prep work. And typically that's what I would do. And in my past experience of less adoptions, I would spend at least a few months with the future product group, less product group to be, to prepare to do certain things that will set, set, uh, set, set us up for success. One of those things that we do is to identify individuals, um, users or stakeholders that will be directly responsible for providing clarifications. Now, we don't need a policeman. We don't need a, you know, someone in a uniform to enforce this. So we have to uh, properly identif identify these individuals up front. Now, I'm yet to see um, a successful um, policing of this done by a product owner. And in fact, the, the, the role of a product owner in Scrum is not to police uh, communication between um, end customers, between users and teams. The role of a product owner is to define priorities and set strategy and vision. And this is actually the same exact thing that we do in, in less. The, the, that, that set of responsibility is retained. So we stress a lot um, the importance of just talk. And, and that's just that. So it may sound uh, ironic, but if you properly identify individuals involved in, in, in communication between users, stakeholders, and teams, it's just that. You know, you can pick up the phone and call, you can chat, you can create a, there's so many different mechanics that we can implement. It's like dozens and dozens of tricks. But the whole, the whole idea is not to have middlemen that are translators. Because by doing that, you just elongate your, um, your feedback loops. If you, if you remember that you know, graphic, the, the, the cartoon we have ha with having multiple BAs and proxies and, and, and in between Go people, um, that just doesn't, doesn't improve things. It just creates more translation. Yeah. Hey, uh, Gene. Thank you, sir. Yeah, th thank you very much for that question. I got a cool question from, from someone. Uh, he's asked it a couple of times. And um, what he's asking is basically uh, how, how could you move forward a, a less adoption if you had, for example, a mainframe development team who, for whatever reasons in their mind, they they were dead set on sticking to a, a waterfall delivery approach. Yeah. Well, you know, I, that's yeah. kind of a left field, but you know your thoughts would be appreciated. Sure. I mean, I personally don't have experience with working with mainframe with COBOL developers uh, adopting less. And frankly, I don't have experience working with COBOL developers and mainframe adopting basic Scrum. So I don't think it's a it's a less question. I think it's a scrum question. Let's say, let's, let's simplify the, the question here. Imagine you have three to nine mainframe developers, numbers wise, it, it, you know, they, they meet defi the definition, that they, they meet requirements of a scrum team. Can we build a single team out of those mainframe developers so that they can work together uh, as, you know, as, as T-shaped people supporting each other and 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 doing and, and doing work that is very scrum like. If the problem is there, then the problem will persist in less and it will just amplify. So I don't think it's a less issue. Now I can also say something else. And again, I, I'll have to be careful and walk on a limb. Well I'll walk on a limb when I say this. Mainframe developers seem to be more seasoned, uh, not just experience wise, but but people that have been around long enough so long uh, so that they choose not to change. I, I've seen uh, many case studies where Scrum has been successfully implemented for COBOL developers. I personally was not involved. I don't see there is, uh, I don't think there are any case studies that explicitly talk about less adoption for mainframe. See, less adoption, just like Scrum adoption, is for product development. These mainframe developers oftentimes support um, very old, very legacy backend systems. 
that require mainly maintenance, but no new product development. And for them, I guess it's okay just to get by. So large-scale Scrum isn't for everyone, just like Scrum is not for everyone. So instead of trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, why not focus on those parts of the organization where it will be really beneficial? So I don't have much to say on that front. Um, I think there are many, many experiments that we have captured uh, in less that could be applied to these guys, to these mainframe developers. Six, there's a whole you know, gamut of things and I can share that they're, they're freely posted. It's an expert from a large, uh, from, from, from a second book. Uh, okay. on the HR and so, so anyway, I probably have exhausted it. Yeah. Next one. I have a question on where you were showing the architecture person is part of the team. How do you keep three to eight teams not going in different direction architecturally, thus destroying the product? What's the vehicle to keep them kind of aligned? Well, Ronaldo, right? So, um, yes. First, again, we have to backtrack a little bit and think who are the people? So, when we build these teams, and by the way, teams build themselves it's a, it's a we, we stress a lot the importance of self-organizational self-design of teams we help them with a blueprint what a team should look like but we uh we don't create teams for teams but when the, this is happening when teams are being built we ensure that every team has enough skill set and expertise and domain expertise and and, and technical expert text and technical technical excellence to be able to work from the same backlog on pretty much any feature, any item, seamlessly. Now, how do we make sure they don't go in different directions? Like, let, let me take another example here. Um, during us, where is my sprint planning? Uh, I'm sorry, where is my PBR? Where is my sprint refinement here? Above here, sprint plan retrospective. Uh, here we go. So during a backlog refinement, we almost remove the boundaries between teams. We, in fact, we don't like the blue box. The blue box indicates that the whole team, one team uh, does refinement their own. We want, just like we like, just like we like promiscuous programming, we like promiscuous refinement. When you have a bunch of people come into the same room or on the same virtual call together, uh, discussion, refinement, estimation happens together. So we stress a lot and we uh, require, request a lot, mandate a lot, um, cross team collaboration and not through delegates and translators, but directly. Now there are other um, channels through which knowledge gets passed. We refer to this as a developer traveler when you have one person going from one team to another to seed knowledge. We uh, very strongly emphasize and support the notion of a community. Like for instance, if you have a, a architecture community through which it's for functional learning, by the way, it's not for uh, performance management or any other managerial function. Through this community, you can normalize and standardize many things that um, are specific to a component, like an infrastructure and architecture. We also emphasize the importance of mentorship. I wonder if there's a, um, you know, this diagram of a mentor, control F, mentor, yeah. So this, these are some of the key uh, communication channels that we expect in less. This is one of them, component mentors. Take these senior guys that are very savvy in a given component, and instead of making them owners that do not let anyone touch a component, which basically makes, makes them into a bottleneck, they turn into mentors and educators and teachers. So as far as making sure that not teams don't go in a, in a, in a different direction, uh, just because organizational structure and reporting structure is so simplified and the whole product group is together working on the same product, this is less of a concern. But again, organizational design is the first order factor. So we have to make sure we structure teams and product, the whole product development group in a way that is supportive of that. 
if you if we are if we're expecting the same to be true of a legacy of a traditional organizational design right now the, you, you, your concern is valid most likely people are going to go on different tangents developing their own things because they, they will be very locally optimized each one of them would like to do something um, on their own um, and something very you know they don't want to claim credit they want to be heroes unless this problem goes away just like this crime it goes away and properly execute this crime thank you yeah so we had some we had some other questions uh gene i'm gonna i'm gonna pack one at you what uh, what, what do you do when you have more than one product in less uh well again so let's make sure we we don't cross too many badges here uh, we work on one product large so the less product group does not work on multiple products if you have if you have um multiple products let me rephrase that if you first we shall challenge always so during the initial period of time during the initial phase of less adoption when we do a lot of discovery work we challenge and we scrutinize what is called a product today not and by the way today's session when i when i uh, when i taught today's class uh uh, it was a big theme there because people were so so adamant uh, about making sure that the concept of a portfolio doesn't get uh, impacted. Well, we talked about what's called a fake portfolio, a bunch of fake uh, initiatives stapled together because it's just more convenient to manage. We don't have the notion of a portfolio, a program, in less. In fact, a project is also a fake word, right? doesn't exist in that in agile world and it shouldn't should not exist in the agile world but um we scrutinize the notion of a pro, uh, the what, what is really uh called a product today and we always try to make sure that whatever is a product is from a customer's perspective a product if a product is defined from a technical perspective or from a standpoint of a technical lead most likely unlikely will be a real product why am i saying this because nine out of ten times if you properly define a product and make it wide enough what you call multiple products are not real products are just components of the same product in fact there's many case studies out there including my own that alludes to that some some uh it, it's really based on organizational design right if you take um an application that sits on a platform and call it a product and have a team built around that application and it's an application team it's not a feature team then of course um, you will you will be you will have a dilemma of finding a product owner because no one is going to be able to prioritize work just for one application for one component you need multiple components stuck together and then you may find a product owner who cares about the business value flow or for you know cash flow so but definitely you don't want to have uh, more than one product so if it's if it's a very widely defined product and uh up to eight teams cannot handle it uh this is a smell of a less huge opportunity less huge and i haven't even mentioned this term yet yet is when you have hundreds of people involved um, and instead of creating a fake portfolios you just spin off you create another product requirement area we call it a requirement area and how it gets done, it's a longer conversation. Um, you can either send off one team, it's like a lead team to experiment and then it grows into a requirement area. So we have multiple less, I need to probably um, illustrate this graphically. Or you just erect um, a, a, a requirement area de novo. So let me go control F, it's called huge, right? Uh, maybe another one, maybe this is it. Yeah, while you're looking for that, I want to note you guys are asking some some pretty deep tactical level questions, which are are all part and parcel to when you were to take one of Jeans's classes, would delve into into these different aspects. Uh, so I'm really appreciating that you guys have stuck around this far, have asked such productive questions. So kudos to to our attendees tonight. 
Yeah, I was, so th thank you for the comment, uh, Mar Marcelo. I was just, um, I thought it would be more difficult for me to find it. This is the illustration of Less Huge. Obviously, it, it looks, it may look busy, but actually it's very simple. Each one of these stacks, it's not mocked up, but this is less. So stacks of less side by side will give you less huge. Each less, each less is uh, one product area, pretty large product area. The only additional organizational complexity that it gets added in less huge is who used to be a product owner, now it's called an area product owner because it's a requirement area, product requirement area. But they operate, they act, they behave, they operate as true product owners for that area. And there's only one additional layer here. Uh, it's called the overall product owner. We call it just a product owner, we call it. Everything else remains the same. Think of Microsoft as a huge product. Excel is one less product group. Access database is another less product group. Uh, PowerPoint is another less product group. Uh, you name it. Um, Excel, I think Microsoft Word is yet another. A, a less product group. So uh, again, but again, remember large scale Scrum is Scrum. So it's not Scrum underneath of multiple organizational layers with additional roles and responsibilities. It is um, le it's, it's Scrum. We want more people, we want, we want fewer people to have more responsibilities than too many people have very few responsibilities. What kind of metrics uh, do, you, do you use? Uh, story points and cadence? Do you use any uh, uh, like okay. um, flow, flow metrics or anything? Yeah, well, let me use one funny graphic here. You know, um, I guess I'm going to say this, and I mean this in a very respectful way. Things don't change from Scrum to less. Now, very swiftly, can we, we can use a plenty poker using multi-side development. Large scale Scrum is not about distributing teams, it's about multi-side development. The only true metric, in my view, that, you know, there's a huge number of things we can measure and, and, and gauge, but the only thing that matter is what really puts a smile and satisfaction on, on the product owner's face and makes your customers happy. So velocity could, could be through the roof, you could be going supersonic in a completely wrong direction, you could be doing not twice, four times amount of work in, in a fraction of time and still go, be going in a very wrong direction. So we don't care about the outcome as much. We care about, out, we don't care about out, output as much. We care about outcome. Uh, whatever the team wants to implement, they will do. Uh, cycle time, throughput, um, aging, uh, whatever. You can leverage the entire gamut of things you look in Kanban and say, let's, let's try. What I would not recommend is imposing metrics upon teams and make them come from organizational structures that have very little um, understanding of agility and very little to do with day-to-day -day dynamics right and by the way what i'm showing at right i'm this you can say you can say oh planning poker by eight teams how possible it's very easy if you have proper aid in so if you're all in the same room it's super it's super easy if you, even if you have a few sites with people in localities in different rooms it's super easy and even if you have to be distributed like today many teams are it is super easy the thing is uh in large scale scrum every team is able to touch any feature any item from a backlog it's not like my team does these things and your team does those things that's going to be local optimization 101 um another nice slide to illustrate the same would be should have used my uh, other deck. Uh, where is it? Yeah, here's a good example. Component teams versus feature teams, right? This is the typical structure, legacy organizational design, waterfall, uh, XYZ heavy framework that has um, so-called scrum underneath of many layers. You got each team do doing their own little component centric quirk, very local optimized. If let's say I'm just pick a name, Omar was a product owner here, he would be very pissed the team C, that is a component uh, team C, is working on the item that is so down below in the backlog. But truth be told, 
component C couldn't do anything else, Omar, because that's the component, that's the only thing they can do. They were organized by components. Now, if you look at these teams, true feature teams, each team can touch any of the components, then in the order of priority, they could work seamlessly. And then um, you as a product owner, or I, if I was a product, I would be very happy because they work in the order of priority from a business perspective, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Very little coordination. Yeah. Go ahead, Marcel. Hey, hey, hey Gene, we, 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 we've got a, a question from left field, which is what, what is, tell us a little bit about the life of an executive or somebody like that in an organization that, that is using the, the picture on the right rather than the picture on the left. Tell us a little bit about what in your experience, what, what an executive's life looks like in that. An executive's life. How so, are we liberated? I, 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 so first of all, one thing to, to, to be clear, we need to define who is that executive? What does he or she do? Because calling someone an executive uh, means to me, like for instance, in large customer, we don't talk about leaders because there are very few people that are leaders. They're highly paid managers maybe, but it does not make them leaders. But maybe someone, can, uh, is it uh, Ronaldo? What was that you? Yeah, it cuts a check. <laughs> yeah. Oh, who cuts a check. So executive, so let's, let's again, let, let's peel back the onion a little bit. Who really cuts the check? And frankly speaking, if, if funds come from the uh, revenue center, not from the uh, profit center, uh, so there's a lot of background. So I think that's you. Yeah. Yeah. So an executive. So one of the things that we do, first of all, let me step back a little. Uh, during that initial phase of preparation, before we flip the switch and go less, we get what's called, I wish I should really do this. Hold on one second. Uh, just give me, it's going to take a fraction of a second, but it will save us um, some uh, confusion here. Let me fire up another. Here we go. You see the, do you see the informed consent thing? Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is informed consent in medicine? Obviously we get it from a patient in legal, we get it from a client. It's, um, it's, an, it's, a, it's a consent that a person understands what they get themselves into, whether it's a surgery or legal, transaction. We uh, work closely with senior management who is responsible for organizational design changes up front to make sure they understand not just in spirit and support, not just in spirit and cut a check. We don't want these kind of managers in support because if uh, the only thing they're willing to do is to give support in spirit um, and, and give a, you know, a slogan in a town hall and then go back to the, to the, you know, to their, corner office, this is really not support. We expect lots of Gemba. Gens, it's in Japanese, it's a, it, it sounds Genshu Gimbutsu or Go See. These are the managers we need. We need senior managers that are willing to get out of their warm seats, hot seats, come down to the factory floor and see where action is. Yes, money is nice. In fact, we're not asking for more, we're asking for less. This is something that probably maybe it will be an aha moment for some of you. Less adoption does not require a huge investment. Less adoption will probably require some investment in the form of maybe you need to bring in a few uh, senior and um, well-experienced less coaches and trainers, but you actually simplify your organizational design. You're removing waste. You're removing unnecessary roles. You're certainly not relying on large scale, uh, bombastic, mind blowing uh, global solutions in, form of, in the form of frameworks and, and, and tools. Those cost money. Those would require sponsorship that, is, that has many, many zeros to it. A less adoption does not necessarily have to translate into a huge investment. Yes, there is an investment in terms of changing individuals' um, learning, individuals' um, 
involvement. You, the, the expense is not monetary. The expense in the for, is in the form of improving organizational design. The most expensive uh, investment I would think with vertical scrum is when we address site strategies. Because sometimes we need to open or close a site or move people around to bring them together. That's the expensive element, the, the rule, the hard dollar. Everything else is um, not a hard dollar. Like, you know, you don't need to bring a hundred consultants. You don't need to forget about a hundred. You don't, you, you don't need to bring 50 consultants at $9,000 a day with a thick PowerPoint deck, do the math, of course, uh, and, and budget it for a year or for yeah. two years, whatever they say. Yeah. You can bring one or two or three senior people that really understand organizational design and are going to take you through short incremental improvements. And I'm going to put a, a, an improvement, a, you know, weight loss program that is five years out. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Well, uh, I want to say thank you. Uh, we're coming up here to 7.15 in, in the evening. Uh, we have lot, lots of really deep, probative questions. Um, you know, it, it, I, I got to tell you, this would probably be not the last conversation that we have on this matter. Uh, I, I, I promised you this was going to challenge you, you guys a little bit, and it sounds like it has. Um, we're going to make some some of this information available after afterwards, uh, right, Rick? We're gonna we're gonna make some of this content available. We're recording uh, this absolutely. session, so we're gonna you know? re we're recording it right now. We're gonna go ahead and send it to Gene as well because he has a great YouTube site that he mentioned that he has a lot of his videos there. So we want to make sure he gets that up there. But we're gonna make make it quickly available for you as long as you register um, in that link that we sent you earlier. Please make sure you do that. And yeah. um, go ahead before we continue, Marcelo. Anything else? Well, anything? yeah, no, I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna tell you that, um, you know, I, 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 I want to say thank you to Gene for, for doing this on such short notice. I mean, clap my hands. I know we lost a few people on the way, but I want to say thank you um, because he pivoted and 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 came on tonight like a real trooper. So again, thank you for coming out, Gene. guys. Uh, look at these links that, that, that Gene's putting out there. Check them out. Read up. Do, do your research. Okay. If we're going out there trying to make a difference in the community, which is, remember, what Rick and I are, are trying to do, bringing folks like Gene, who's got worldwide connections to help broaden our, our horizons. Okay. We're not an agile backwater here in South Florida. Okay. We got to leverage it. So I, I encourage you to go look up all the stuff that Gene shared with you, okay? And and more will be coming on this topic soon in the future. Okay? Awesome. So thanks Great again, job. Gene. Appreciate Great it, job. man. Great job. You guys. It's a pleasure being here. And and, awesome. and I try to be very transparent. Um, if you have any questions, yep. uh, I'm easy yep. to find. You can just ping me. And I have a Slack channel, yep. which is free. But you can always right? ping Okay, guys. So real quick, real quick, let's, let's make give sure. Give me a second. Give me a second, Rick. Give me Go a second. You forgot, Rick, because Gene forgot that. I know he's he's very humble, but I got to give him his shout out. At the very bottom of this of this slide, there is a link. We will be providing it for, to you. Look at that link. It's a slide less basics. You have a group discount for being a, a South Florida Agile Association member. Thank you, Gene. Okay. So I encourage you to look that up and get yourselves informed. Okay, so awesome. uh, and then another thing that we're doing, guys, that we always do after the event. Um, Nailu, you there? She's gonna go ahead and post a LinkedIn. Yes, um, so you can see it on the chat, everyone. So if you guys go to the chat again, that's the only thing that we ask from you. We give you great events, but we do want to keep continuing this momentum, and the only way we do that is to get you know. Um, so if you can go ahead and click on that link, thank Gene there for his great job and all that, share it. So that we can continue get getting the um, you know more people to join our groups and, yep. and keep family. Now yep. to continue the the conversation, again we have our Saturday um, activity that we do. It's a coaching clinic from eight thirty to ten thirty. Great way to meet coaches, have that interaction. That one on one. It's been growing. So I please join us. Um, go into the initial link that we sent you earlier. 
If not, you can see it there with, with TE Culture. Make sure you're visiting that site. We are expanding that site to really help the community. So we're, we're doing things for people that are, need jobs. We're out there to try to help you. I know Anna's working on some material to show you what, what you need to look for when you're looking for jobs. We're also looking for volunteers as well. So we're gonna be reaching out to the community to see if we could do special projects to continue to help build this. Like, wouldn't it be great to be in one site and you get all the information you need related to jobs, related to opportunities, related to what's the latest things out in Agile? We can create that, we can be that, that group. So we need to continue moving in that direction. We've had great turnouts. Um, this, again, um, is, is a great start to, to, to making a great connection with Gene. He's, he's very humble and, and, and it's going to open the door to a lot of learnings. Take this as many of the learnings you've already received. This is another thing to your toolkit. Keep growing, keep learning. And it's all about giving back to the community. We've been doing this for many years now. Um, so again, we thank you for the opportunity. We do like to take a final picture, even though I took a picture. If everyone turns their video on, I want to have yeah, to take please. another picture just so that, again, we keep this in. Um, and I like to, again, scan the screen. So make sure you're at your best. Fix your hair. Um, where is, um, yeah, Mel, fix that hair. Okay. Come on. Make sure that on that. Good. Um, so again, I'm about to snapshot. I'm going to say, hold on. As soon as I say go, it's going to be a snapshot. Hold on. One. Two, three. Awesome. Did we get Gene in that, Rick? Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Fantastic. All right. So great Fantastic. job. Again, make sure you like the link and share it with your friends. Thank you very much. And we'll be here next Thursday. And guess what we're doing next Thursday? We've got Business Agility, Kanban. We're going to be talking about Kanban next week. So please make sure you're joining us. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, folks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, so much. Right, thank you very much. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you. Great job, Gene. Great Bye. job. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank no, you I'm absolutely, man, I pre appreciate. I'm gonna owe you that beer, man. Thank you so much. I'll take it. Guys, guys, I'm serious. You got to check out all that information. They got the guys uh, like a freaking library of Alexandria.